Okay. So, topic one gave you a nice introduction to the subject. So what we have here is like we everyone is excited about artificial intelligence. What what exactly the artificial intelligence is? Okay, can anyone describe me? What comes in your mind when we talk about AI? What is AI? Yeah, just give your definition. Not even a definition. What comes in your mind? Very first thing which you think when somebody talks about artificial intelligence. What comes in your mind? Just roughly say it. It may not be correct. It may not be perfect. But uh, I just want to listen from you guys. Yeah. So anyway. a means to reduce the need for humans to be doing repetitive tasks. Okay. So your idea of AI is like we helping machines to do the repetitive tasks. Is it? It's one use of AI. Okay, the one, one, it's, the one I, it's the one I implement at work. So okay. that's what I think of. Okay, okay. no worries. That, that's great. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, anyone else will try? So one, one idea which we get is to do repetitive tasks. Okay. Um, Next. To assist people in doing their jobs. So um, yeah. being able to, I suppose, cross-check things. Perfect. Yeah. So assist people. Yeah. Assist human to do their jobs. Very good. So assistive technologies. Yeah, that's fine. Anything uh, ways else? Of, ways of handling big data that a human wouldn't be able to do in any reasonable amount of time. Analyzing. Okay. So analyzing, analyzing and dealing with big data, big data. I'm just writing everything. <laughs> okay, good. Next. So people are also writing in chat. Oh, uh, people can chat, yeah? Oh, oh no, people are writing in chat. Ideas oh, in chat. Okay, yeah. okay, ideas in chat. Yeah, I, I'd say replacing people in some situations, um, like dangerous situations. Yeah, it's going to say oil Or life-threatening situations, yeah. Mm. Like even that people Mars rover thing where they've got... Yeah, someone has of... written um, a self-regulating system. That's really good. Self-regulating, self-regulating systems. That's pretty good. Yes, excellent, excellent. Keep on attempting. Okay. Well, uh, everyone is partially correct <laughs> because they cover some aspect of AI. Yes, AI help us to do some repetitive jobs. You can see in robotics, robotic arms help us to do repetitive jobs, but they can also help us to do non-repetitive jobs as well. And they help us to assist. Um, they assist in different uh, everyday life tasks. For example, um, there are assistive technologies, but these technologies and repetitive tasks are also possible without intelligence. Yeah. So there, there are IT systems and uh, mechanical system and electrical systems which really help uh, us to do repetitive jobs without any intelligence. Yeah. Um, but when we re particularly talk about artificial intelligence so the word intelligence is the main focus so when we say someone is intelligent um, it has many capabilities uh, but the major capabilities is of reasoning right so it learn from experience it learns from its environment any intelligent agent learn from the environment sense the environment and from that sensing it learns and that it uses its reason and cognition power to, and why, while it is used reasoning, it can help the intelligent agent to take decisions. And these decisions can lead to some actions um, or something. So these three are the main pillars of AI, which one is sensing. If you look at the diagram, you can see one is sensing where you know, any system or even we look at humans. So we have sensors all around. We have five major sensors, but our skin also a sensor, um, which is a tactile sensor, which sense, um, uh, which is a touch sensor. So we, we sense from the environment. It means like we're sensing. We are, these sensors provide us data and that data help us to train our mind or train our brain. So what is training is like, it's experience. We develop our experience over time from these senses, from this learning. And an intelligent agent, we say we are training the agent. 
uh, for us, we are saying we are getting the experience. So once we get more and more experience, our decision making becomes better and better over time and our actions becomes better and better. For example, if we look at the child, so um, the baby start crawling and then start walking and then becomes more stronger. The senses get better data, get more experience, then becomes really good athlete sometime yeah, in their life. So better sensing, better cognition leads to better actions. So these three things are connected sensing, cognition, and performing. So when we talk about artificial intelligence, it's like uh, particularly all these skills uh, are, are done artificially, like they are not part of the human, uh, like uh, some, some sort of natural word, they are coming from artificially. It means like we are developing a system, we are trying to design a system away, um, by putting all these three capabilities in an artificial way. So uh, if I summarize everything together, so basically we are trying to design a system, any intelligent agent, sense the environment, learn from the environment, use a reasoning, and then adapt according to the needs, perform some actions, okay? So that's just doing. So the type of actions can be repetitive, it can be non-repetitive, it can be intelligent, it can be non-intelligent, but like mostly it has got here. So the major uh, like uh, over here is the cognition. This, this is the capability which makes AI system different from other systems. Like you, somebody said, assistive technology. So assistive technology sometimes has sensors and uh, these sensors sense the environment and do something. So they have sensors and they have actuators which do the actions, but they don't have a cognition. The simple assistive technologies, they exist. They are not intelligent systems. But once they put that, that brain into it, like which is a cognition, that's a major thing. So in this subject, our main focus is not on the sensors. Our major fo focus is not on the actuators. Our major focus is on the cognition side which is how to make decisions, how to interpret the environment, how to uh, get an idea what's going on and how to predict something, okay? So that's, that's the major thing. So um, we, we can, um, if we just look at the sensors, so um, sensors are there from years and years. If we look at the actuator, that's where the robotics and other things come, come um, like that's the engineering part, that's the engineering part, that's the engineering part, but this is the major part, which is AI plays, is the cognition, like the getting an understanding uh, of, the, of the sensing data. So we need to develop how we can get this um, sort of understanding over time. So that's AI. So if I say AI, AI is more about cognition, it's more about understanding, it's more about reasoning, it's more about uh, thinking, taking a, um, a rational decision, right? So th that's what it's all about, okay? But uh, th there's not a, um, a single definition of AI. People think in a different way, okay? So that's why they um, saying like there is a one standard definition of AI, it's, it may not be possible to define it, but uh, that's how it is. Okay, so now what I do? to keep moving, clear all the drawing. Okay, how this idea came into the mind? Um, actually, it's not a new idea altogether. Um, this is a quite old idea. When uh, we have the first computer back in 1940s and 50s, um, many scientists were working uh, to design a machine which can do a few things for us as human. Um, so the first computer came and during the same time, uh, there was a British scientist called Alan Turin. And um, he was a guy who was really thinking like the, there are two things which are required to make intelligent decisions. One is knowledge and one is logic. So he said like, if uh, we human have the knowledge, it means we have the experience and we have the logic, which we have the reasoning. So if machine has these two capabilities, machine can also perform the same thing. 
So he uh, wrote a paper in 1950 called Computing Machinery and Intelligence. So this was the breakthrough paper in which he described the idea of designing those machine which use knowledge and uh, logic. Okay. And he came up with a, a like how to test that something um, is intelligent enough. He came up with the idea which is called Turing test. And it's uh, quite famous like Turing test, imitation games, some movies um, talk about it, this concept. So the idea is like, suppose this is a hypothetical kind of a situation where you have got three agents, A, B, and C. C is considered as the judge because uh, the other A and B are trying to communicate to C. However, C has no knowledge who is who. Like the communication is coming from A or B. The, the whole idea behind this test is to um, for C to judge whether the, the one of A and B is computer and one is human. So if C is unable to differentiate between A and B based on the communication, like it's coming from computer or it's coming from a human. So it means like A has passed the test. So in other sense, if the A and B are equivalent in terms of communication powers and C is unable to differentiate whether it's a human or machine. So it means like the A has passed the test and that's called Turing test. But this particular test, all they know, uh, like require is natural language processing. Like if B is communicating in English, A is also communicating in English. So it's a two way traffic. They are chatting to C and C is unable to differentiate whether it's a machine or it's a human. So it's a, it's a qu quite powerful concept, but uh, it, it was back in 1950s. And so there are many different version of the Turing test right now, but this is uh, a baseline test. Okay, so a lot of history. So if you look at this diagram, it will tell you all major milestones in the history of AI. People were initially very, very excited about AI. Um, so there was a lot of hype back in 1950s and 60s. At that time, computing power was, wasn't that great. Uh, over a period of time, this hype gone really, really down. And uh, especially there was an event uh, about the computer vision. And at that time, scientists said it's such a trivial problem. It's, it's not a big, difficult issue. For example, at MIT, um, Samuel Peppert, uh, one of the lecturer, he gave an assignment to the students to, um, to use a robotic arm and uh, arrange the block of uh, woods. Okay, so that was a problem he considered that this is a class assignment, but uh, for 30 years, student uh, like scientists started working on it and they couldn't do it. So it's a, like, it, it wasn't that easy problem. It's an AI computer vision problem. So that actually, um, some people got really uh, distracted by this and they said, okay, maybe achieving AI won't be possible or it may be, it's just a hope. So they were quite uh, pessimistic about it, but uh, in the last 10 or 15 years or so, uh, things has gone again into hype and that has become possible because of some of the revolutions in the field of computer vision and natural language processing. There's a conference uh, called CVPR. Um, it organized in US every year. Um, and uh, in, within that conference, um, some researchers from Stanford, they came up with an idea of 1 million images. Um, their data set was called ImageNet. Um, so they, they organized a competition about the ImageNet and, uh, and then um, uh, the competition started. So one of the group uh, achieved excellent results and over a few years of time, like they achieved better performance than human. And that triggered uh, a new revolution in AI. And that's how the people are excited. That's how the businesses are excited today. Uh, like there's a lot of hype. So in last 10 years or so, there's more uh, work in AI than in last 30 years or so. All right, so rest of the lecture, if you see these slides, um, okay, a uh, few things I'll explain, but rest is just straightforward. Like what are the major capability of an AI system? 
um, it includes these three are considered main like natural language processing, speech recognition, computer vision. Natural language processing is like the computer is now able to uh, write um, the contents from like nothing almost. So you just give a suggestion, it can write stories for you, it can write novels, it can write all the literature, it has also written a new version and a new season of Harry Potter in a nice way uh, without mimicking. Um, so uh, natural language, they, they have developed chatbots which can um, uh, do the two-way communication just like human. So natural language processing, a lot of scope, uh, a lot of work has been done. Speech recognition, you have seen uh, Google, uh, Google Home and uh, Alexa. They are doing, and Siri, you have seen these uh, speech recognition systems. Computer vision, you have seen video surveillance, security. Um, you have seen uh, uh, a similar kind of satellite image processing uh, and a lot of applications um, in, in other areas as well. So major capabilities of AI system is, the first thing is knowledge representation, like they become expert over time more training they get, better they become. So the knowledge representation is like they develop knowledge over time and they learn from each other. They also transfer knowledge to each other and, and like this. So this is a really um, good capability, just like human. Planning, they can do planning. We, today we'll see in lecture number two, how the planning is done. Um, reasoning or problem solving, that's another skill, like how the problem solving is done. So how we as, as a human approach problem solving and how we can have a similar kind of a behavior we can introduce into machine. Okay, then comes about learning. We learn from our experience. So can machines learn from experience? There's a entirely new field of deep learning and machine learning where uh, we will discuss in next few lectures that how it works. Um, and rest is all about uh, high level of intelligence, like perception, understanding, social intelligence, uh, emotional intelligence, and those things. These capabilities are also emerging over time. Okay, so there, there are a lot of applications of AI now. Um, and the system has become really stronger over time, and especially in the last few years. So there's huge uh, number of applications in different fields of agriculture, healthcare, um, and different businesses. Okay, the last thing from this lecture is about uh, defining general intelligence. Okay, one of the capability of AI systems uh, today and uh, so far is to look at uh, different problems identifying the scope and solving them in an intelligent way. For example, playing chess, um, playing uh, a board game, okay? So they have won competitions against uh, world champions, but that's fine, but that's simple artificial intelligence. That's not general intelligence. What, we, if we really want like, Tomorrow, um, AI systems can replace or maybe at par with human, they need to get general intelligence. And that's called artificial general intelligence, which is AGI. AGI is a very high level goal. So at the moment, um, we haven't achieved AGI. We have achieved some success in artificial intelligence. We haven't achieved some anything in AGI, which is artificial general intelligence. And what's mean by this? Like uh, um, we are intelligent capability are very specific at the moment, right? So we can uh, design a system which can play games. We can train a system which can play games. Yes, and even games are very specific. They can, uh, for example, we can design a system which can play chess. And then we keep on revising and training it with mis and uh, removing its mistakes over time and time and time iteration until it has become so special that it become an expert in chess. Okay, that's fine, but it's still not general. Can it play all the board games? No, okay. 
to play all the board games, it need to be multitasking. Okay, not only uh, like specific in one game, it need to be generally um, not to be expert, but a general intelligence. So we human have a general intelligence, like we we can do many things, uh, and even we can learn really fast. Uh, we can learn, uh, we can act in unknown environments, okay? So even our training is not done in some circumstances, we can still, and for, we can really generalize things very well. For example, if we haven't visited a, a, a new country, um, in the very first time you're visiting that country, you can, uh, like, for example, you've never been to Africa, you've never been to America, you've never been to Europe, and you've been here all your life, but um, suddenly you need to travel those countries, so you will really adapt very easily. For computer, it's not the case. For example, if you design a driverless car, a driverless car uh, works really fine in the defined environment, like in lab situation where the things are pretty uh, constrained, like the road is really neat and clean, um, and it can predict only few uh, vehicles will enter. Um, and then uh, the map is really given um, perfectly all right, and these things. So then it will perfectly all right. The, there's no collision. However, if you put the driverless cars into a situation where unknown situation, system miserably fail, there's a lot of traffic coming. Pedestrians are not um, um, like, uh, pedestrians are violating rules and they are just coming on the road uh, from all sides and anything can happen, any unpredictable, unknown situation. So, so AI driverless cars will behave really like uh, um, in a worst possible way, right? So that's why one of the reason why these AI systems are, people are not trusting them to come on the road and come into, in this effective situation because they don't have general intelligence. They have only specific intelligence. So that's what I mean by AGI. So it's a dream of humankind to achieve those systems which have AGI skills. And uh, um, we predict that, um, some people predict like maybe in 10 years time, 20, 30 years time, we can develop those system which has AGI. Uh, some people say no, maybe it take more than 100 years. Some people like, so hey, who knows, right? So it, it is some, some of the companies have started emerging in the field of AGI, like OpenAI. So you go and visit the website of OpenAI. So they, they will give you uh, like uh, some of the project which has similar capabilities as human. So, and even sometimes they say it's better than human. So these are um, some of the exciting areas to work on. Okay, now the way we're gonna do our labs, uh, we're gonna use Google Colab. So what's a Google Colab? Google Colab is a kind of a Python environment um, where um, you can do programming. Uh, you can run uh, any, pro for example, if I click on this lab one, um, Think, let me go to collab. Okay, so this is welcome to collab. So here you can see um, you how can you get to collab? Uh, if you have a Google account, maybe a Gmail, um, it means you have access to Google Collab. It's just like many other services provided free by Google, just like Google Drive. Similarly, you have Google Colab. Um, so Google Colab, what, what actually it is, like you can run your code here. Um, so if you look at this, you have a file here and you can do a lot of stuff related to data. You These are the two major ones, code and test. If you click on code, you get a kind of a, um, a sim simple, uh, yeah, let me close this thing so can I can move. Okay, I can show you here. If I say text, so I can write here um, very easily. Welcome to AI. 
Okay. So that's fine. If I say encode, right? So if I say three plus five, and I say run. Okay, so it's a bit slow at the moment. Uh, okay, but it has shown you the result. Okay, so it's, it's just like any scripting kind of environment where you write a few lines of code, you just say run and it runs for you. So the, this is uh, just explore Google Colab. Just the, the simple idea is to go online, type in Google, Google Colab, just click on it and then you are up and running. You don't need any installation because it's based on cloud. Okay, so you can also run uh, different workbooks. You can start a new workbook. You can open an existing one. And once you have done your work, you can also save all your work into your Google Drive. You just say copy to drive, just click on it and it's saved in your Google Drive. Next time you want to come, you just go to file and say open, open work. And it will, for example, in my case, if I say open, so these are all the files I have been working on. So you can see these all are Google Collabs, which I have worked. So you can find if you want to have a search, some particular ones you can find it out okay so this is quite easy uh, kind of environment you don't need any installation you don't need to do most of the stuff it's done for you another powerful feature of google collab is uh, it has given you um gpu into free gpu integration a gpu is a graphical processing unit which is um uh, which is required if you are doing really high level computation high compute and most of the ai systems need high compute they need gpu like you uh, you're working with images or videos and processing you need gpu like cpu will be very very slow so if you go to runtime uh, and say change runtime type so here you can select which option so at the moment by default it's a cpu but you can choose either uh, GPU, either TPU. TPU is specifically designed for tensor, TensorFlow, uh, because tensor is a kind of arithmetic which you, um, which specifically used for AI systems. So most of our um, um, labs will be done through GPU. We can also try not to use GPU, then it will take a little bit more time. So you can al always switch from um, one environment to another environment. You can also upload data, like some of the, the data where uh, you need to work on. Just click on this left-hand side um, file, if you click on it, and then you click on this upload button. So then you can choose from, for example, I choose from here um, and say open, I say okay. So their, their file is uploaded. So when you, you run your system and you need some data files, so you can upload the data files straight away, but the I, but it this data will remains for a single session. So once your session is ended, like when you close this file, you leave this environment, your data is gone as well. So every time you, you do it, you need to upload it again. So that's all about Google Colab. And when we will doing specific exercises, um, you will know more about it, okay? Because it's a, it's really exciting to, to work with AI systems. Okay, any question guys? So far I've been talking a lot, so I think uh, I need to learn from you as well. So any comments, any questions? Uh, I don't really have any at the moment. Okay. Yeah, thanks for letting me know at least. Yeah, I, I know there's someone who is really involved in discussion. Okay. Anwar, it's yeah. John here. Yeah. yeah. Um, could I, when I went to join the lecture, I was a bit late and I went to the Zoom lecture on the, um, uh, on you know, on our, on our home page there at the subject home page and uh, there was no link in in the in the zoom lecture um, page 
I'm just wondering, do, are we going to always have to go off your latest email to get the link? Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, John, for clarifying it. I think uh, um, the reason why it hasn't been set up yet, because I wasn't aware like how you guys, um, you want to run your class, uh, because the first class was run by Professor Manoranjan. And uh, so he, um, uh, he was very kind, like I wasn't here and he just uh, um, replaced me with, with that lecture, like he, he was happy to take that lecture, but he actually looked at his timing. Um, now, uh, I have come back and now onwards, I will be your instructor for the rest of the semester. So uh, during this time, uh, again, last time we had two classes uh, merged and during this time, both of the AI subjects were merged. So the one class I have moved on uh, on Wednesday. So for this class, I wanted to have a kind of a uh, poll, like majority of you, if you agree with this time, then uh, next on, I'll put a uh, Zoom link for rest of the weeks. Okay. So let me know okay. if this time suits Thanks. all of you. And then uh, this time is really good. I think uh, uh, if it works for all of you, uh, I'll set up a pool, and if majority of you say yes, then possibly any one of you think like this time doesn't suit. Yeah, I have to leave early if it's this time. Okay. I've got stuff at seven every week. Is the okay the sessions go for two hours? Um. Well, it depends because I tentatively said two hours because, you know, um, sometime in AI, you start discussing something, it takes more than <laughs> like yeah. an hour, right? So, uh, because the things are technical, it, unlike other subjects where you just have a very fixed time and you complete everything within it. Here we have labs, here we have to discuss our labs, we have to discuss mm -hmm. many content. So, um, tentative two hours, but uh, I try to finish as early as possible, but minimum one hour. So it okay. will be between one hour to two hours, but it depends if we cover our contents, then it's maybe one hour or one hour, 30 minutes. If we don't cover, at least you allocate two hours time. Uh, in case if you you can only allocate one hour, then in, in that case, you you have the recording available. So you can come, always come back to recording and see like what happened when I left the lecture. So that kind of thing. Mm. Okay. Is that fine? Yeah, that's yeah. fine. Thank you. Okay. It's not going to be a big deal if I have to leave early if, if this is the date everyone else picks. That's fine. Yeah, All I quite right. like this. I like this time Um, in regards to the days. As long as it's not Monday, I'm fine with either day. Oh, perfect. Yeah. The other option was Monday, but you said no Monday, so it's fine. So um, it I'll make like the a... executive decision, you know, Monday. Yeah, it'd be good if it would be good if we could all vote on a poll just to make sure everyone's because oh, yeah. some people who there's there's people who won't speak up on a mic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. So I'm quite happy to to run a poll. Yeah, because I uh, I think if majority of you agree on this time, that would be really great. It works for me. Um, actually, unfortunately, well, I'm happy I, with it, it on this time too, and well, that's oh, fine for me. Oh, thank you. Thanks for that. Um, the reason why I'm saying is like, unfortunately, I'm uh, not that flexible in terms of timing. This session, there is, I'm teaching five subjects, so do uh, like almost every day I have lectures. So um, these are the only two days, Monday and Thursday, where I get some spots like uh, rest of the days. Again, I have lectures. So quite, quite busy session for me this time. Uh, so uh, I found Thursday, uh, you, you have only two options available, either Thursday or Monday. So um, and the uh, the timing which works is like because um, I assume like majority of you are working somewhere. And that's why you are coming in the afternoon. And if you're working somewhere up to five, I think I gave you like at least 30 minutes to get relaxed. And uh, then we start at 5.30. And so 5.30 to seven, I try to finish. If, if in some of the topics, if we, there's more content, we may go beyond seven to 7.30, but uh, I think uh, I'll try to finish on time. Okay. All right, thank you very much um, for your feedback about the time. Um, I continue because today I have a lot more content to cover. So 
All right, so now let's jump to topic number two. Okay, before I jump, let me know any of your questions from week one. Yeah, week one is introductions, but you may still have any confusion or something, just let me know. No? All right, otherwise you can write, or you can always write your question. If you're hesitant to ask me questions online, you can always write your questions in the chat window and I and occasionally I will have a look like what questions you have. Um, okay, okay, you have a clash uh, on Monday, some other subjects. All right, majority of you thinking uh the monday is fine <laughs> okay all right so uh, i assume like mondays uh doesn't suit with few of you so thursday 5 30 um is the relevant time so i think uh, i'll be sending this invite for rest of the weeks i'm setting up this time so now onwards you will be looking at the zoom meeting link which is online zoom where my cursor is at the moment so you'll see the link over there so far, I didn't set up because that's why I put this time this week only. Because, but now you will get all the relevant links from online Zoom meeting here. All right, so let's jump to topic number two. Okay, that, that's very exciting topic about intelligent agents. All right, so different subjects have different terminologies, as you know, like when we and um, studying physics we say object when we studying chemistry the same thing is called substance um so what the same thing is called when we are studying ai so it's called agent okay so we call intelligent agents because the that's a word what we use so anything any software system any hardware system like robots we design we call them agents so when we say chatbot so it's a software kind of robot uh, we we call it agent okay so this is a very generic terminology about ai systems we call them intelligent agents okay so what's mean by an intelligent agent um, an agent um, can be anything that can perceive its environment okay um, and perceive through senses we are also intelligent agent as a human because we perceive our environment through our senses our eyes uh, um, and uh, other senses as well and then we we perceive this environment we understand what's going on will they have help of cognition which is which is provided by our brain uh, we learn from experience sometimes uh, our environment provides us totally new information sometimes the information is relevant to what we have already learned so we do some kind of a correlation with the previous task sometimes it's entirely new task Okay, so uh, sometimes we totally innovate entirely something new, which is not there. So that's the capability of our brain, which we all try to understand. Okay, um, okay. So an intelligent agent perceive the environment through senses. And then once it has understood the environment, then ask the actuators to do some actions. Just like if we want, uh, for example, if there is a threat, okay um and we want to run okay so we are telling our actuators our legs to uh, to run so uh the, here the actuators are our legs because they are actually performing an action uh, so you you can relate this to a um a robot in um a robotic agent also does the similar things it has got sensors cameras work like eyes and also a sensing um, works in in all different kind of environment uh, where they perceive the environment then they have some algorithm intelligent algorithm which interpret that data and then they take the decisions what to do so uh, so agent uh, if you want to define the agent again, it's like it's it's uh, 
um, anything which perceive the environment and, and uh, try to use uh, that information which it sends from the environment to perform the actions. Uh, yeah. So what the intelligent agent, the intelligent agents um, are those agents um, which are a little bit, um, uh, they are comparatively have advanced skills. The one of the advanced skills is they, they are fully automated. Okay, they are autonomous entities. They also sense the environment um, and they can take decisions and their decisions are autonomous decisions. They, are, they don't really follow someone. They don't really uh, have fixed rules. Um, their fixed rule may be written in the algorithm, but uh, it differentiate them. They can learn from the environment and they can adapt. Okay. And uh, that makes it differentiate between AI system and IT systems. In IT systems, when we write a computer program, we have a very hard coded kind of program. Like we have fixed set of inputs, we have fixed set of outputs. Okay, and the program can't really run. Program has only one solution, one chance to do the actions. Okay, but in intelligent agents, there are several options available and each option is adapted to its environment, how it should be taken. And, uh, and every time the action is repeated, most of the time it's better than the previous one. Okay, so it's improved over time. It means it's adapting according to the time. So that makes intelligent agents better than the uh, simple agents because simple agents are simple IT systems. They are pretty hard coded. Like they only do specific kind of actions, no matter how the environment is changing. But in terms of intelligent agents, they adapt to their environment. They, they take the scenes according to it. So um, what are the rules? They, they must have the ability to perceive the environment. Um, they should be able to make decisions. Uh, these decisions should result in some actions. And these actions must be rational actions, like rational, uh, like they should be a sort of optimal, like it should be the best answer. Um, for example, a driverless cars can be an intelligent agent. You can see uh, different sensors attached to it. So if you don't really know, so this kind of a sensor, anyone can tell me what the sensor is? Isn't it a camera that um, is looking at the surroundings? It's 360 yeah. degree camera, isn't it? Yeah, yeah but uh, this particular kind of a it's not a camera actually it's a lidar sensor lidar lidar sensor okay so it's keep on um, uh, revolving all around 360 but um, it's it's not a camera so uh, it, you you can see it's a it's a 3d camera but it doesn't work with uh, just like a normal camera it's a 3d sensor so if you have iPhone uh, 12 Pro and uh, 13, you can see in the cameras, there is a very small camera. And, and for example, I can show you here. Mm. If you can look at my, uh, um, here you can see it is a very small kind of camera. This is a LiDAR camera. Okay, it's a very, uh, it's not that powerful, but this is a LiDAR. So what's a LIDAR? Light is a light emitting. So it's a um, kind of laser beam, which is um, giving you a sense of distance. How far is some object from you? So- uh, Like bat sonar? Yeah, that, that kind of thing. Yeah, you can see in, in, in a sonar, you, the only difference is like in sonar, you send the sound wave. Here you don't send the sound wave, here you send the light. Anwar, isn't it? Um, LIDAR is what the police use for their speed detection. So they point the radar at some car and it bounces back with the distance. That's how they get their distance. So is that the same thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. So yeah. Distance from all the other objects around it. Exactly, exactly. You are quite right. Yeah. So the LIDAR is um, a sensor which is located here. So this is also called a 3D LIDAR. 
that three D because it it perceives the three D environment all around it. So it's not a, a a camera. So it's a three D lidar. So it's it's sending signals all around light signals. Okay, so because they are laser lights, but they are not harming laser. It's a uh, um, and uh, so if there is any distance and even so the light because light is the fastest um, thing um, we can see in universe. So light is just um, for example when it has a collision, just like uh, it has a similar principle as uh, you can see radar or maybe similar principle to uh, to sonar. So it, once it has, it tell you the distance. Okay, so distance. So it keep on revolving, getting the distance and get a 3D perception, like what's um, around the car. It also have cameras as well. And uh, there are two designs in driverless cars. One is entirely based on cameras, which is computer vision. And one, most of the cars use LiDAR rather than, because LiDAR is uh, more accurate. So we have LiDAR, we have other sensors, cameras, and then we perceive the environment. Uh, that's how it works. Um, but, but this is the intelligent agent because once you get the information from sensors, then the, the car is able to understand what's going on in the environment and then take the scenes. All right, so that, that's how it works. Um, now I'm just escaping. I got a phone call from somewhere. Yeah, just a minute. Okay, sorry, I, I got a phone call, so I had it to return. Okay, now, well, this is an intelligent agent. You have this, there are sensors. Uh, the environment can be road. It can be other vehicle. It can be road signs. It can be pedestrian. So they all are part of the environment around the driverless cars. And then you have sensors, which include GPS. Um, you can have other similar kind of sensors all around the vehicle. And you can have actuators like steering wheel and uh, brakes and other things as well. So these three things, sensors, environment, and actuators make it uh, um, uh, an agent. Right, so the, the only one thing which is missing here, which is not shown is cognition because this is uh, a capability to interpret the information coming from sensor and, and uh, once it is able to uh, is capable to recognize that information and interpret it what's going on for example if there's a pedestrian crossing the road and um, needs to put the brakes on so uh, it all depends how how the system which is installed the intelligent uh, software which is installed in the car will decide like how to behave okay so intelligent agent most of the time we we design for our help because they solve problems for us. We have everyday problem. For example, even driverless car is solving a problem for us because we want to automate the driving system. So this is a sort of a problem. So, and so we want to solve this problem with the help of AI system. The way we can do it, like we can simplify most of the things. One of the way we solve our problems in daily life is like if our problem is really, really complex, uh, one approach is to divide that problem into smaller problems and try to solve these smaller problems one by one. And once we are able to solve those problem, then we gonna combine the results and our problem is solved. And this technique is called drive and conquer because this, this is one of the strategy how we can uh, solve most of the problem. But this is just one way of solving the problem. There are so many other ways to solve the problems. Okay. Um, one of the way we can solve our problem are related to um, possible solutions. We have more than one solutions available and, uh, uh, and we just need to find like which one is the better solution. This is the, for example, we have a point A and we want to go to point B, okay? For example, you are in Sydney and you want to move to Melbourne. So there are many, 
uh, ways you can do it. One solution is like you, um, you are really a good athlete and like you say, I've walked to Melbourne. How many days it would take? Yeah, months? I, I, yeah, some days, yeah, weeks. Okay, so you, you go by walking. Another way you can do is like you uh, are a cyclist. So you say, I use a, a cycle, a bicycle, a cycle. And another way you can use, yeah, you can drive to Melbourne. Another way you can go is like take a train um, and go through Canberra. Another way you can, you can fl fly directly to place. So see, a single problem got many solutions, okay? Now, this is a very simple problem. We need to go from point A to point B. And we, when we thought about different solutions as a human, we found that there are many possibilities and each possibility end up in a solution and there are various possible solutions. Now, which solution is better? It depends what we want. It depends on our constraints. Okay, if I want, for example, I want to reach Melbourne from Sydney within um, eight hours. Uh, sorry, let's relax it a little bit. And then I say 12 hours, example. Oh, that's my constraint. Like I need to reach Melbourne in 12 hours. So certainly the walking is gone out of the window. This solution is not feasible. Uh, cycling is also not feasible. The cycling, if it is cycling, this is not feasible. So that's not a feasible solution. What is feasible solution at the moment is like if you take a flight, okay? Uh, another feasible solution is I take a train. And if uh, maybe um, I can drive as well, like within 12 hours. Okay. Uh, um, yeah, that's a pretty strong constraint. But so these are the three possible solutions which will work for me. My, this is my constraint. I call it constraint. This is my problem, which is problem. Sorry for my writing here because it's very difficult to write with a mouse. Okay. Uh, all right. So, so we have a constraint. We have a problem. Every, every problem has a constraint. And there are possible solutions. And these all possible solutions are called solution space. We have a solution space. This is the space of my possible solutions. The solution which are not possible called infeasible solutions, infeasible solutions. And those are possible called feasible solutions, right? Because these are possible feasible solutions. Out of these feasible solutions, I, I just skipped all these, but I out of these physical, uh, the feasible solutions, I'm searching for the best option. And the best option is called optimal solution. I, I write over here on the left uh, hand side. I call it as an optimal solution. What is an optimal solution, which is the best possible solution out of these feasible solutions? So this whole problem are finding the optimal solution. If my constraint is to find the, um, okay, I can put another constraint in the, into the, my system. I say, I want um, a cheaper option, okay? So I want to spend less cost on my travel but I also want to be within 12 hours. So the flight, uh, I have to check the flight. Sometimes the flight is cheaper and sometimes uh, the driving is cheaper. Sometimes the train ticket is really, so suppose at the moment uh, the flight is really cheap yeah, because there's some special offer going on and like we say, oh, the flight is cheaper. So then I qualify for the optimal uh, option which gives me the best uh, in terms of uh, timing, best in terms of cost, and that called the optimal solution. So at the moment, what I'm looking for, I when I look at my constraints, either I'm minimizing my constraint, minimum cost, right? In this case, I'm minimizing this cost. Um, and minimum distance or mi minimum time. When we try to 
minimize the time. Okay, are we trying to maximize something? We try to, this is our cost function. This is our cost function. So when we uh, try to minimize something, I try to maximize something, this is called cost function. So our cost function, and this whole problem is called optimization. Okay, when we try to either minimize something, either maximize something, and it will lead us to optimal solution, uh, or suboptimal solution, then we say we have optimized the system. Okay, most of the time it leads us to optimal solution. Okay, so that, that that's the uh, one of the problems. So we can define a, a rational decision making in terms of optimization because we say our human mind think like they look at system first, try to understand the problem, try to understand what are the possibilities, try to look at the constraints, then work with the constraint and say which one is the best option and then take that option. And that's how our mind, human mind works. And we can do a very similar approach when we design AI systems. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, are you getting me? Or is yep. too much? <laughs> okay, yeah, just, let, just let me know if uh, any of the terminology is unclear or any of the process is unclear or yeah. Okay, all right. So now we have a similar strategy here. One of the way we can search, we can search this solution space by using such terminologies. So we, rather than saying solution space, we say a search space, like we have possible solutions and we looking for the best option. And here, rather than saying best, we say optimal. And uh, we have to start from somewhere and we have to have a goal, like where we need to achieve. Like in, in this case, a, uh, like Sydney is my start state and uh, Melbourne is the goal state and the search space is all possible options which I have. All right, so now let's move a little bit to possible options. One way we can, uh, the simplest strategy is to make a, a tree of options, which is called search tree. And uh, then see like um, every path has a cost associated and then um, finding out like which one works for me. So there are two kinds of search algorithms to find a, a good solution. One is based, uh, one is called brute force or blind search. Okay, generally when we, we deal with uh, uh, mostly searching techniques, sorting, we have done programming uh, with Java, C++ or something, we have looked at data structures, different data structures. So. Um, uh, simple searching techniques like merge sort and others. So the, these sort of techniques were pretty blind. Why they are blind and why they are called blind and why they are uninformed? Because we have very limited knowledge about the problem. We don't know like how far we are from our goal. Okay, so we are not using that knowledge, that expert knowledge. So that's why these techniques are called uh, uninformed because we have less information about our goals. So these kind of techniques are based on brute force because we just try uh, hit and try. So we, we keep on um, uh, exploring different options. Uh, one of the technique for searching here, you can look at this problem, which is called breadth first approach. You, you got this tree, for example, this is a, uh, a tree data structure. And um, so you have uh, different nodes of this tree. Okay. And you have got edges. Uh, so this is a kind of a, um, a okay. That's why I, I was saying there should be some prerequisite for this course, which is called data structure. Data structure tells you about trees and uh, graphs. So this is a kind of a, a data structure where you have a directed. Directed mean like the arrows are going from one way to another. So you have to follow the arrows. So many techniques, one of the techniques is called breadth first. This is our goal state, which is called K and our starting state is called S. So we have to go from S to K and what we are looking at, what's the best possible way to, to reach K. So how do we find it? We don't know where it is in the tree. 
because when we are at state s there are many options and we don't know where the k is located at the moment we have no idea so the way we can do one approach is to to explore the breadth first so we go from s and this is breadth number one this is breadth number two this is breadth number three breadth means levels level of this tree so we we start first level we start from left to right so we first say a a is not a k because it's not the uh, target um, and then we go to b it's not the same so it means like th this option is not then we go deeper then we explore c then d then g then h and our goal state is not there then we move to another level and we find a f and i and it's not there as well and then we move to next level and we find the k okay this is called breadth first because we are exploring the whole whole breadth one at a time whole level one at a time so like a pyramid okay so is we are doing so this is one way of searching if you are totally uninformed where your totally uninformed like where your goal state is okay so th th this is a breadth first approach there can be another approach which is called depth first approach so depth first won't really do the same it will be doing like this so it is take the first branch which is a to c to e and a so it can do like this come back and explore other then come back for explore others so it's a, it's like it's going into the depth luckily um in the first depth we found k but what if the k was up here okay so then we go from here we could um we spend a lot of time exploring it we didn't get anything we come back to s and then next branch then next branch then next branch and finally we get to the k because we don't know where the k is okay so so this is called depth first both depth first and and uh, breadth first has their own weaknesses and strength the breadth first is um, is guaranteed to find a solution because uh, it explore each and every breadth and finally it get to the goal but it takes a lot of time and memory uh, because you know if the breadth is here, the breadth is only two or four, but what if the breadth is 1000 and 10,000? So it takes a lot of time to explore one breadth and get nothing, move to next, where it's even larger than even larger and so on. Similar is the case with, uh, with the depth first. In depth first, you, you may have a depth of 1000 or 20,000 and the other branches are smaller. So if you go deeper and deeper, found nothing, then you are spending a lot of time and you may stuck up in a single branch and you never get to the optimum. So th these are different ways like you can explore uh, your research, your search space. Yeah. So uh, these are the options, but this kind of techniques we have learned in data structure and other subjects. So it's not intelligent enough and it spends a lot of time. Now we are moving to AI world where the things becomes uh, based on some information and the, the, the information is like uh, what we call trick. Okay, so you may, somebody give you a, a, a trick and say, why don't you try this trick? Or maybe uh, what we call from generation to generation is like you, you have from previous generation, there is some wisdom transferred to new generation and then, and so on. For instance, um, I don't know how many of you know about uh, Bermuda Triangle, like um, any plane goes there and this, uh, yeah, you don't get any clue where it has gone, that kind of thing. For example, over generation and generation, people have transferred this knowledge to other generation like what's going on. So this is a kind of a trick. And in technical terms in AI, we call it heuristic, okay? So this knowledge which is transferred uh, is called heuristic. So they, this is some link. Uh, this is a in, intelligent comment which we can use intelligent information. It can be a value. It can be anything which can help us to find the decision. So it means like this is is heuristic is information. So that's why 
any search techniques which use heuristics is called heuristic search or informed search because here you get the information okay um, any heuristics can be shown uh, as a function function mean like you can calculate its value and uh, that's as shown by heuristic h of n where n is the name of that node number of that node okay um, h is here symbolizing that heuristic that value now um, what we uh, assume in a system whatever the value of heuristic we use is not overestimated okay we want to make sure it's not overestimated and what's mean by overestimation for example if the the cost is just like uh, from sydney to melbourne is like 12 hours so any trick uh, which can help us to reach faster from sydney to melbourne should be less than 12 hours otherwise that trick is of no use to us if any trick can help us to uh, or lead us to spend more time uh, that's not a trick that's not a heuristic so heuristic will be some value which make our, our solution better right rather than worse so that's why here we are saying and he, in technical terms we call it admissible quality admissibility admissibility so heuristic should be admissible it means like we can rely on that heuristic okay so this is the actual H steric of n, which is the actual. So whatever the heuristic H of n value we use, it should be less than or equal to the estimation. It should not be more than estimation. It should not be overestimated. Okay. So that, that's the clue which we use in most of the techniques. Any questions? Okay, no questions. Either you're following everything, either you're not following anything. <laughs> Okay. No questions. All right. Okay. No. Okay. Got it. Have a good one. All right. Excellent. All right. Mm, okay. All right. You, I, I was, yeah. Anwar. Yeah. Could you put that last sentence there that says, "Hence, heuristic costs should be less than or equal to the estimated cost." Can you put replace heuristic cost and uh, estimated cost, replace that in the example of getting to from Sydney to Melbourne? What's the heuristic cost in terms of getting to sit from Sydney to Melbourne? Excellent. So heuristic cost should be less than, for example, uh, at the very first time, I'm an overseas visitor, right? I never have traveled from Sydney to Melbourne. At the first time, I, I just have rented a car and I'm now traveling. Okay. Now, I didn't ask anybody at all and I start moving, moving towards Melbourne, right? It may take me, I don't know the route. I just rely, um, don't rely on GPS, don't rely on anything. I just started moving. It may take me like 18 hours to move Melbourne, right? So, um, because I, that was a blind search that was a brute force search which we discussed last time here right that was an uninformed search i didn't get any information at all and i just started moving towards Melbourne. now if i uh, ask the same renting company and say i say well uh, can you please tell me what the fastest way to move to melbourne it say okay maybe you take hume highway or you take this path and this path and these things and say then it will be faster Okay, um, if you um, like, like there's some some information from somebody who has got the knowledge about it. So then I use it as a heuristic and uh, uh, maximum, it can help me to reach Melbourne within uh, if if they say maximum, it can take 12 hours or maximum, it can take 15 hours. Uh, and I if I reach within 15 hours, it means heuristic has really helped me to reach over there. Right. And that that's really valuable. But if it, it has led me to um, like making it worse, for example, rather than 15 hours, I spend two days. It, it can be because of my own mistake or some other reasons, but here we are looking at the problem heuristic, like everything we rely on heuristic. So heuristic should be, uh, should not be overestimated. It means like it should be, if the time is 12 hours, 
So the heuristic can help us to uh, reach in 12 hours or less. It shouldn't help us to reach in 13 hours because 13 hours is more than the estimation. That's what it means. Did you get it? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, so yeah. can I play that back? Just um, following along with John's thought there. Um, yeah. If you could just scroll up slightly so I could just read that yeah, sentence yeah, 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 correctly. Yeah. Yeah. So what we're saying is that the estimated cost there is that initial 12 hours that I thought it would take to drive there. Yeah. The yeah. heuristic cost is how much is what it actually takes it me based on information. Yeah. So if so I end if up you, finding a really cheap flight and it took me this two is, hours. This is there's the estimated cost. Yeah. yeah. So that's twelve. So yeah. H time there's, then ends up being twelve hours in this scenario. Yeah, for example. And H of N could be two right. hours if I got a good flight. Yeah, exactly. So this should be less than this. Yeah. So yep. then yep. it's really good. Otherwise, it's it's not helpful. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that. Yeah, I think that clarified uh, me as well. What were your question? Okay, so uh, there are many ways to look at this problem, but um, one of the famous way to solve this problem is called a greedy search. Okay, um, uh, are called the best first search. Why we call it greedy? Because um, well, when we go for optimization, uh, there there's uh, an optimal solution, but there is a global optimal and there's a local optimal. Okay, what's mean by this? If you are uh, climbing a hill, for example, and you want to reach the top of uh, Mount Everest, or some like you, you just start climbing and uh, you have no idea where is the top of the mountain. So what you do, you just keep on climbing and then you get the top. And you may think like this may be the the uh, the top of the mountain, but it's not. When you reach over the top, then you say it's just local top. Eh? It's not the global top. So there's a local optimum and there's a global optimum. Okay, I may try to use my pen here. For example, here you get the mountain. Okay, in this scenario, in a mountainous region, when you start from here. So if you reach over here and you, you may think like maybe this is the, from here, if you see, you see it, maybe that's the top of the mountain, but it's not. Actually top is up here. Yeah. So this is called local optimal, local optimal. This is called global optimal. Problem with most of the problem is like they stuck in a local maxima or minima. They are unable to achieve the global maxima minima. If most of the AI algorithms are able to achieve the global maxima, then um, they are really good systems because that's what we really want. We want to design those systems which are not stuck in local map. There are many techniques. There's a topic about gradient descent and, uh, uh, and here we, then we really talk about like how we can achieve it. But at the moment, just skip it because it will distract you. Okay, now let's have a look at the best first greedy approach. The greedy approach is like a person, for example, um, you, you start discussing a business idea with uh, your friend, okay? So you say, okay, well, um, I, I, we can start a new business and uh, you will in six months time, you get like uh, a $1 million profit and uh, in six months you get this much and then one year time you get this much and in five years time you get this much. Okay, so if your friend is really greedy, you will be thinking uh, uh, not a long-term basis, but on short term, really short term basis. You say, okay, maybe I try working with you for, six months if i get a profit of one million then i'll decide that whether i will continue or not okay so the idea uh, searching this problem is a greedy approach like looking for the local optimal and neglecting the you you may give him an option well in the in next few months time we may have a loss okay we don't have a profit anymore but in five years time we will get a really like one trillion dollar profit and if that person is greedy he will never go into it he will say no i don't want to have any loss at all because i need a local optimal right so so that there's a greedy approach the greedy approach is like they always look for what is near 
that should be optimal. They don't really care about what is coming in the uh, next five years uh, and what is remote. Okay, so this algorithm, finding for best first, whatever is coming first should be the best. Okay, so uh, this technique is a greedy search approach and the way it works is uh, very simple. For example, here in this uh, diagram, you can see um, for example, a greedy algorithms now try to um, uh, try to find the largest sum of the following tree. So it's if you add the start state of two at the moment two. So you have two options here, 25 and four. The greedy algorithm will take this option, 25. Okay, because sum of two and four is six. Sum of two and 25 is 27. So the, uh, the greedy algorithm will take this path. When they reach 25, then they, they have only one choice available, which is three. So you, they get 28, okay? But this 28, at, uh, locally it looks the best answer, but it may not be the best answer because best answer may get from here, which is the global maximum option, okay? So the greedy algorithm, is not guaranteed to find the best solution. The reason because it, it always go for the, the local optimal. It has no intention to find the, the, the basic intention what was to find the global maximum. Suppose if um, sometime accidentally it can also find the global because suppose if that part is not there, in that case, it may find this one pretty um, comfortably and it can find the best solution as well. Uh, but there's also possibility like if this is not the case and uh, it is included, then it won't find, it won't find the global maximum. So greedy algorithm, the idea uh, is simple. The greedy algorithm here, the heuristic, that what is the heuristic here? The heuristic is select the best, the long, uh, like the select the largest value, select the largest value. That's the heuristic here. So what's the heuristic function here? Uh, like if, uh, for example, the dad is uh, um, just giving you a rough example, like if the dad is uh, greedy, tell the son, like, you need to be greedy as well. <laughs> Suppose like it, it telling, it's uh, transferring that knowledge, transferring that heuristic, you need to be greedy. And uh, the way you can say like, look for uh, that value, which is higher always select the cost which is higher, okay? Uh, always find that project which has give you maximum return, that kind of thing. So this is a heuristic. This is the knowledge transferred from somewhere. somewhere. So here the transfer knowledge is getting the largest sum and a, this guy finds the maximum value but stuck into a local maxima and never get to the, uh, to the actual maxima. So that's why um, being greedy is not good. Yeah. There is another example um, where the heuristic function, the values are given. And uh, uh, you can also solve this problem using heuristics. Um, I don't, uh, the, these values which are given on edges, just forget about them because they will distract you, but just look at the heuristic function values. So if we, I start with S and I want to go to G, um, so I will be looking at uh, my heuristic values and the way I approach this solution is given here. So I'm looking at um, two values, A and B. A's value is uh, at the moment is given as 12 and the B value is given as four, right? All right, sorry. Okay, so here the things are quite different because here we were looking for the long, largest value. Here we're looking at the shortest values because it's looking for the shortest path. So one is a higher value, one is a lower value. It takes a lower value because here it's a different uh, objective function. Here the cost function was maximizing. Here the cost function is minimizing. So which is the minimum value is the best. So B has value four. A has value 12, so it will choose B. So it has chosen B. And then from E and 
if again it has a value of nine it has a value of eight uh, sorry uh, it's mm, e and f so e has a value of uh, eight and f has a value of two so it has chosen f okay so from f again so you have to look at this heuristic value not not this value okay so uh, that's how you use um, I mean, this is a greedy uh, algorithm, which does. There's another uh, revised algorithm, which is called A star. The A star algorithm use a, a function, which is a mix of two functions, this one, which use two heuristics. One is the value of H and one is the value of G. So, a, so the way it works is a, it's not looking only the value of H, but also looking these edge value as well, how far this value is from the start state, that's called G. So G plus H, it will calculate and then take the decision. So I haven't given the solution here, but you try at home, like how it will work. So use this formula to, to, to apply it to the same problem you will get the solution um, because it's a very well-known problem. So you will get many different examples of A star. Uh, it leads uh, to a discussion of a very interesting problem in, in, in computer science, which is called traveling salesman problem. What's the traveling salesperson problem? Is um, like there are cities, like there are random cities, and there's a salesperson who, who want to sell a few things, uh, goods from, and want to visit each and every city once only, um, but looking for the shortest distance, which city to visit first, which to visit second, which to visit third and so on, and looking for the shortest path. This is the problem uh, which has really uh, troubled computer scientists for th more than 30, 40 years. And there are so many solutions possible. Uh, you can try it a different greedy algorithm like Dijkstra. You can also try um, A star. You can try different algorithms. Um, so uh, if you get time, just watch this video, which will tell you a little bit about the problem, what this problem is. Uh, let me look at it. Okay, we still have got some time. So let me. Hello, and welcome to the um, can you listen? This video provides a basic answer. Just a minute. Right. Yeah, we can hear it. Yeah, okay. You hear it? Yeah. Probably need to turn it up there. Traveling salesman problem. The traveling salesman problem is a classic problem in mathematics, operations research, and optimization. The original problem involves a traveling salesman who needs to visit several different cities. The question is which order to visit the cities to make the shortest possible trip, in which the salesman visits each of the cities once, and then he returns to the original position. Usually some tours, where the route is broken in multiple trips, are not allowed. What makes this seemingly simple optimization problem interesting is that it applies to a lot of the less interesting problems. Manufacturing circuit boards, making the best order to drill holes can increase the efficiency of the process dramatically. In drone flight planning, choosing the optimal path through the desired waypoints can reduce time or extend the area that can be covered in a single flight. There are other considerations in each of these problems, but at the core, each can be viewed as solving. of cities grows, computation time is where it grows even faster. Integer programming using branch and bound is an example of this type of approach. Problems with large numbers of cities are usually solved with the heuristic algorithms. And the 
across the aperture solution, training a little bit of distance for a long solution bit. This is an example of an approximate solution of the first degree sound bed, which guarantees a solution with no greater than one AM time set on the capacity. To summarize, today we covered the basic definition of a traveling salesman problem, which is essentially finding the shortest path to a useful set of locations. Poorly, or approximations, which are fast, but can return longer paths. All right, so. Okay, so that's a very interesting problem uh, because you can apply a traveling salesman problem into many different um, problems like related to business, related to manufacturing, related to other uh, industries. So that. That's really interesting. It, it just like uh, another name of this is uh, connecting the random dots. So these are different cities. Um, you are trying to connect these dots um, in, in a way that every dot is connected and uh, the path which you get is the optimal path. So it's, it's not a simple problem, to be honest. It, it takes a lot of time to figure out its solution uh, sorry, I can't hear you. Can you repeat? Yeah, there was, yeah. Many years now. Yes. Uh, many years hear. ago, I was at university doing engineering, and uh, uh, I don't know if you, I don't know if you missed that, but uh, we were told that there was no way that we had enough sort of minutes left in our lives to solve, um, say, a, a large travelling salesman problem precisely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. By simply the eliminating every single one. Mm, yeah. Uh, I think there's some dis distortion in your signal. Um, I could only hear you until you said. Um, okay. I, don't worry. Uh, forget about it. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're right. Uh, like it's a, it's a quite a good problem, but it's like, uh, it has taken a lot of time to solve, but this is not only one problem. There are so many other computer science problems where the intelligent minds are working to figure it out, like how we can solve this problem. But this problem gives us in, uh, the idea of discussing it is to giving us an intuition, like how can we approach a problem? Um, and get the intelligence and how can we design some systems which can also think like us. So uh, to try this problem, I have given you a lab exercise here uh, where the code is given um, and you and the, uh, the file which is provided in an Excel is uh, 50 different cities in US and their uh, distance in terms of their location in terms of uh, longitude and latitude um, is given in the Excel file that this program will get to all those uh, locations and try to solve the traveling salesman problem. And okay, I just have a limited time, but I, I think I reconnected traveling salesman problem. This is the one which we are using. Um, it uses a uh, algorithm called two opt algorithm. Okay, so you can find uh, more about two opt algorithm is just one of one type of solution. So two opt algorithm on Wikipedia, you can find it out. So the uh, the major intuition behind two opt algorithm is like once we have uh, these dots and we try to connect them. And if we have a situation where uh, dots are crossing each other, we just uh, we just make it simple. We just uh, connect um, the relevant dots. We, we just try to remove this kind of uh, situation where there is a crossing. So like, for example, here we, we say B to C can be connected and uh, similarly F and A can be connected so we can find out. So wherever there's a crossing, we, we try to, it can help us to solve the problem. Idea is not to understand this problem fully, uh, but to get an intuition like uh, we have similar kind of a problem where the intelligence is required. We need many, many solutions and uh, we need to find the optimal solution and here we are uh, uh, develop, uh, the idea is to developing a mindset, like how to approach 
uh, problem in an intelligent way. Okay, so the so the idea over here is not don't get confused like we have to read too much and we have to um, really go through all the mathematics and understand it and then this will come in an exam so don't worry about the exam and anything at the moment what i'm trying to convey to you is to uh, giving you an exposure to different sort of problems and different solutions um, um, i'll explain like how uh, we can visualize this whole thing um, and like in terms of uh, actual implementation for example if you look at this and if I, this solution is provided to you, uh, you can go and check it like here, all the files are provided, the city file, CSV file is provided, a TSP uh, where the solution is, and the TSP uh, where the actual Python code is. So don't really try to go into details, just try to run it. Okay, that's what it is intended because I don't assume like you go through each and every line of code and try to understand what's going on. If you want to do it, that's fine, but uh, that's not the requirement. The requirement is to just to know like how to run this program and uh, try to visualize like what is happening actually. So I go to uh, section. The way we run it, like either we run uh, step by step. For example, this is one section. I, I try to run it. I just click on it, run anyway. And it, it has done something, okay? And now it says uh, like, uh, I also need to upload that file, which is called cities50. Okay, it says choose file and I have the file. Now it will run. When it run, it's a tick. It means like it has done perfectly all right. I run this one as well. Okay, so what the initial file is telling us, uh, there are cities only five cities are sh uh, shown but there are 50 cities here their description is given on uh, the state and uh, the description of the cities and their gps information latitude and longitude is also provided so their location is given now we want to convert this uh, longitude and lat latitude to a simple cartesian uh, coordinate which is like uh, what, what is xy coordinate and this is the formula which is given here, which we will be using. And once we use this formula, we run it and see. Now we got an, um, a description where we have X and Y values as well on 2D axis. We try to run these cities. Okay, so we get X, Y. Let me run this one. So we have to run each and every block. One way you can do it is just go to run time and say run all, run all. So if you click on this, everything will be fine. And right? so you say run all, it will run everything and uh, you don't need to do one by one. Okay, to mention here, uh, there, there's a library called sklearn. That is the fundamental library to learn um, machine learning and data data science. It's written in Python, there's a lot of versions available. So if you're really interested to have a career um, in AI or in machine learning, it's a really good way to learn sklearn library. It's a really good library to, to learn from. Uh, okay, and it's still running. Yeah, because it's running again from scratch. Okay, so from start, let's choose file because when I clicked it, I started running again. Now it will be done. Okay, now, fine, 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 fine. And the result is stored as a TSV CSV file. I say cancel uh, because I already have. And that's how these 
the result is plotted these cities are connected these dots are connected we can uh, that gave you all 50 cities data all 50 cities and uh, their x y location their latitude longitude information is given uh, when you plot them it looks like this that's the way to visit all those cities you can also plot it with the help of a visualization tool which is given here so um, the way it looks like should be let me show you Where's that link i found it somewhere yeah that, that's the link so here what you need to do to import that gps file choose file i have this file called uh, tsp csv i say open and then i put it okay so it's already done so it's a similar thing so on the actual map it will plot the route from where the salesman can visit and find the shortest path so um, it's just a visualization don't really worry if you don't really understand the code in detail uh, but here i just want uh, i'm included this lab just to show you like how things can be implemented uh, today and how these problems can be solved okay so I summarize um, what we have learned so far is like intelligent agents um, work in a very rational way because they are based on some strategies, exactly same strategies as we develop as human being. Uh, the way we approach the problem, they try to mimic our behavior. They try to do similar things. In this exercise, there was no training. There was no, so most of the things were based on simple heuristics, uh, but um, the AI thing has in, has now grown where machine learning has come up where we can learn from different examples and we can uh, design some systems which learn from several examples and, and uh, adopt accordingly. So it, this is just a simple technique where um, learning from simple optimization can solve some of our problems. Okay, so this, this sort of problem which we discussed today uh, traveling salesman was a simple optimization problem. Okay, if you're really interested to know more about search problem, there's a, some reading material here. There's a blog which tell you more about an introduction to problem solving your search algorithm. And uh, in a really, um, if you just click on this link, and just a um, very simple way explain you how different things work and very simple description of the problem will be provided here okay so feel free to explore this link and uh, find out other similar algorithms as well okay any question guys nope i'm all fine okay yeah more questions just put on yeah to go now okay right 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 okay excellent so i'll put the recording online right um and it was uh, because it's the first time we are offering this subject and its subject is redesigned so your feedback is uh, very valuable um so feel free to send me any feedback if um, yeah i don't really mind if you say that something is uh, this and this and i need to improve in certain ways that would be really great okay so your mm, i always value your feedback feel free to send me email and uh, like if you have any question you can ask okay so next time i'll put all the zoom links here in 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 that link which is called zoom meetings and uh, i couldn't get the time to design a poll today and uh, finding out uh, because i was thinking i have designed it but uh, i think it it was in the other zoom meeting so i assume like 5 30 thursday so most of the people so we remain with this timing so next week 5 30 on thursday we'll see each other again thank you very much guys thank you thank you for your time thanks thank bye. you thank you bye thank you thanks anwar thanks